Welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Tim and we are glad that you are worshiping with us today. Welcome to the church scattered throughout Northeast Tarrant County and beyond. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Before we get started today, I want to highlight a couple of quick things for you. Uh, first, you'll notice on the online worship page that there are resources for children, for students, for adults uh, to help us grow deeper in our learning and to help us with our worship. So I want to highlight that for you. Additionally, if you scroll to the bottom of that page, you'll find a connection card. It's a great way for you to let us know that you're worshiping with us, a great way for us to share prayer requests. Uh, and then finally, uh, before we really get started today, I also want to highlight just one announcement for you. Uh, we are coming up on Christmas Eve, and we are going to have one worship service at 5.30 p.m. on our campus outside in the field in the back. We've rented a big tent. We've got a big space for open seating. And basically, we're going to spread out as far as we need to spread out. We're going to wear masks. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to keep each other safe. But we want to celebrate Christmas Eve together. And so we'd love it if you would join us for that. There's going to be an announcement uh, coming out this week via the e-news, probably early in the week with a lot more details about what that will look like and how to prepare for it, uh, and maybe even some ways you can help. Uh, but I want to make sure you know about that now, uh, Christ Christmas Eve, 5.30 at church. Uh, with that, today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and so we want to begin our celebration and our worship today by working together through the liturgy of Advent. We light this candle as we prepare for the coming light of Christ. Advent is a time to be both penitent and grounded in God's love. We await the better days foretold by the prophet Isaiah. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Today we light the fourth candle on our Advent wreath, the candle of love. This candle reminds us of the love that Jesus has for us and for the world, even in our brokenness. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and love, free us from the sin that hinders our faith, that eagerly we may receive your promises. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, our light and our salvation. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us worship God. Thou is the throne. 
Friends, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God promises to forgive us and renew us. Please join me in confessing our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Lord Christ, we confess our willingness to be loved, but also our reluctance to love. We confess our readiness to accept your forgiving love, but also our refusal to forgive. We confess our eagerness to grasp your offer of redeeming love, but also our resistance to follow you without question. In this Advent time, forgive us our failure to respond as we should. Come to us anew, and by your grace, assist us to receive you with joy as the shepherds, with gratitude as Simeon, with obedience as Mary, with love as you have loved us. Even so, come Lord Jesus, and hear us as we continue to confess in the silence of our hearts. Amen. God, our great reconciler, overcame our sin and death through Jesus Christ and makes us whole again. John assures us of this good news through the famous verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Almighty God, strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in everlasting life. Amen. We continue with our worship. Friends, on this fourth week of Advent, let us pray that God come quickly to this weary world. We respond to each petition with the words, come and save us soon. Let us pray. O oh God, Emmanuel, we pray, be with us. Bless our church and our own congregation. Bless also our neighbors of other denominations and faiths that strengthened by your presence we may support one another in love and together serve those in need. Hear our prayer, O God. Come and save us soon. O God, wisdom of the world, as tomorrow the earth's north tilts back toward the sun, preserve vegetation and wild animals during the winter. Form us into a people who honor your creation. 
Let our decorated Christmas trees be signs of our thankfulness for the earth. Hear our prayer, O God. Come and save us soon. O God, King of the nations, bring peace and justice to the countries of the world. Lead the nations of the Middle East toward peace with one another. Guide our elected leaders towards honest and compassionate policies that serve all the people and preserve our nation from discord and violence. Hear our prayer, O God. Come and save us soon. O God, key of David, look with mercy on all who are locked into despair, who fear the darkness, or who live brokenhearted. Open windows to those who are isolated. Abide with all those who are incarcerated. Give shelter to the homeless and to the refugees. Hear our prayer, O God. Come and save us soon. O God, root of Jesse, nurture our community. Connect us with one another across all barriers and bring an end to historic prejudices. Bless the work of food pantries and relief agencies and inspire the holidays with your spirit of benevolence. Hear our prayer, O God. Come and save us soon. O God, ruler of might, we cry out to you with gratitude for our nation's first vaccinations. Guide all who are working to distribute the vaccines and calm the fears of those who are, who are reluctant to receive it. As we wait, send your healing power to the sick, curb this disease, and strengthen our medical workers. Hear our prayer, O oh God. Come and save us soon. O oh God, our Savior, dwell within us. Make us your home and receive the prayers of our hearts for all whom we name before you now. Amen. And now in the certain hope that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us continue in our worship. join me in prayer. Gracious God, we ask that you would speak to us today, that you would encourage us and challenge us, help us to become your people better. Lord, we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. The story is told of a holy man who was engaged in his morning prayers under a tree whose roots stretched out over a riverbank. During his meditation, he noticed that the river was slowly rising and a scorpion caught in the roots was about to drown. He crawled out on the roots and he reached down to free the scorpion, but every time he did so, the scorpion struck back at him. An observer came along and said to the holy man, don't you know that's a scorpion? And it's in its very nature to want to sting. To which the holy man replied, that may well be, but it's in my very nature to love and to save. And why must I change my nature? Because it won't change its. I wonder if our nature is to love and to save. I wonder if we are becoming, if we have become a people of love. I wonder if we are able to love even when people don't respond, no matter the cost, regardless of what's happening, how we're doing, and how our world seems to be. Or, in other words, as Christians, has our nature been changed 
such that we are now a people of love. Now, of course, we need to be careful as we return to this topic of love because this is one of those topics that gets muddied by the swirl of our pasts and by the messiness of our feelings and by a lot of strange cultural sediments that just seem to weigh us down. And yet, while we all have and have heard many different ideas about love, today we are actually talking about something very specific across all the different types of love. Last year, we spent a lot of time talking about love, and one of the things we talked about are some of the different types of love. Just to review, we talked about uh, eros, let's call that husband and wife love. Then we talked about storge, which was affection. We talked about philia, uh, Philadelphia, where we talked about friendship. Uh, And then finally, we talked about agape, charity, godly love. Just for the record, our passage today is only talking about this last type of love. And yet, regardless of the type of love that we are talking about, our understanding of love is the same across them all. Last year, we ended up defining love as the God-inspired and empowered, committed choice to sacrifice for the good of someone else. The God-inspired choice to sacrifice for the good of someone else. And you'll notice that this means that as we talk about love, we're not talking about feelings. We're not talking about something we get. We're not even talking about something we fall into. Instead, this is a much more practical and real and dynamic form of love. This is the choice to sacrifice for the good of someone else. And this has the power to transform everything. You want to experience more love in your relationships? You want to learn how to love better? It's simple. Choose to sacrifice for the other person's good. You want a better marriage? Choose to sacrifice for your spouse's good. You want a better relationship with your neighbor? Choose to sacrifice for their good. You want better friendships? Choose to sacrifice for their good. Are there exceptions? Are there caveats? Are there disclaimers? Absolutely. But not as many as you would think when we learn to love like this. But let me back up for a moment. During the season of Advent, as we are preparing ourselves for the coming of Christ anew in our lives, we are looking at what it means to be kingdom people. Remember, we just finished a series where we talked a lot about how we should view our lives and our world through the lens of the kingdom of God. A different reality in our midst where we strive to follow and serve our king. And as we do, we bring a little bit more of his kingdom come. But the idea here is that as we are following our king, living out uh, the qualities of our king, we slowly start to become a kingdom people. We start to emulate the king. And as such, we start to become a people of hope and a people of peace and a people of joy and a people of love. And so as we move through Advent and look back at the Christmas story, we're looking at each of these attributes. And today we're talking about becoming a people, a kingdom people of love. So let's turn in our Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 through chapter 5, verse 5. And let's see what happens. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. 
This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the father loves the, his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God o overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. So much good stuff there. Uh, but let's start with the most obvious takeaway of this passage, which is simply love one another. We'll then build on that a couple of times, see if we can't figure out how to do it better and maybe become a different kind of people. But let's just start there with that first point, love one another. It's in there at least three different times. Uh, but it's also probably worth noting that what it's not saying. It's not telling us, it's not commanding us to only love those who love us in return. It's not telling us that we should just love those who are easy to love. It's not saying that there should just generally be more love in the world. It's not even talking about trying to generate warm, happy feelings toward others. It's saying that we, you and I, should love others, love one another more and better. And again, it may be helpful for us to go back to our definition here so that we remember what we're talking about. We're defining love as the God-inspired choice to sacrifice for the good of someone else. God-inspired choice to sacrifice for the good of someone else. And so it doesn't matter if they are lovable. It doesn't matter if they feel or don't feel loved. It doesn't even matter if they are loving. Because ironically, it's not all about them. This is our choice to follow God's example and sacrifice for their good, which really is a deeper and richer kind of love. Because notice, first, it's a choice. And ironically, this actually makes it more permanent than simply a love of only feelings. Because feelings come and go and change all the time. And so if my love is only based on my feelings, it's as flighty as my moods or my tastes or my appetites, which makes it pretty, pretty fleeting. It's like saying, I'm only going to be healthy or be spiritual or eat well when I feel like it. Guess how often I feel like not eating a sandwich or cake? You see, ironically, feelings may not be our best guide when love is at stake. But then second, love is also a sacrifice, which changes how we think about it. Because here's the thing, if we are only willing to love because of our expectation of love returned, of love received, 
then we aren't really willing to sacrifice all that much, are we? We're just buying something, prepaying for something, and it turns love into more of a transaction. I will love you as long as you love me in return. And if you won't love me back, I'm not going to love you. You see the transactional nature there. Or sometimes, I, I am loving them, I am sacrificing for them, and they're not giving me anything in return. They aren't noticing what I'm doing. They aren't loving me back. You can hear the transactional nature of love. I will sacrifice only if you will sacrifice back for me. And while that should be there, that's not why we love. We love because it's the choice to sacrifice for their good, regardless of how they respond. We don't love so that we will be loved in return, or even because we are loved. Because our love is a choice to sacrifice for their good. Which really brings us to that third part, the idea of it being for their good. Uh, and of course, sacrificing for someone else's good is a little bit of a tricky topic because it's not always necessarily clear what they think is for their good or what I think is for their good. You'll also notice that this isn't necessarily what makes them happy, but I'm for their good. Uh, for example, in loving my kids, in sacrificing for their good, you'll notice I am not trying to make them happy. And they will affirm to you, I do a good job of that. Uh, I'm not trying to give them what they think they want. I'm not trying to make their lives easier. Instead, I'm sacrificing so that they can become good adults. I'm, I'm striving to help them become the most and the best they can be. I'm working for their actual maturity and growth and flourishing for their good. Which means that sometimes we are in disagreement about the good that we're each pursuing. That being said, it's still my job to sacrifice for their ultimate good because love is the choice to sacrifice for someone else's good. We always need to be cautious about this one. We always need to be careful. But that being said, just, just the framework, the, the mentality, the mindset here may be the best test of our actions. I'm about to have a, a hard conversation, but before I do, let me make sure that I am for their good. I'm in a hard relationship, but let me make sure I am for that other person. I want this relationship to be, to be better, but, but am I really willing to sacrifice for their good? Not my good, but their good. Do you see how hard this is? This is such a drastically different picture of love than we are taught. And this requires so much more work, so much more time, so much more effort. And yet... This is a better and stronger and deeper way to live. This is a better kind of love that actually has the power to change everything. And it's with this love that we are called to love one another. Which brings us to our second point, because there's a problem. How do you love like that? More importantly... Can we really sacrifice in the way that love requires and demands? I mean, won't you run out? Won't your love wear thin? Won't your love not last if our love is the choice to sacrifice for the good of someone else? Especially as our love is unreturned or goes unrequited, as it isn't refilled. If I keep sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing, eventually won't I not have any love left to give? Or 
won't I simply learn to only love those who love me back in return? Because the reality is our love is not enough. In and of itself, it will not last. And yet here's the amazing part. Because our passage goes on to tell us that we know and rely on the love that God has for us. We know and rely on the love that God has for us. In other words, we are infinitely, indefinitely, omnipotently loved by God. Which means that I don't have to look to be filled by others quite so much. And it means that no matter how much I love, I won't run out. And it means that my love isn't all up to me in the first place. Because God loves me, and then God loves through me. It's also worth noticing how God's love for us is described in this passage. Because you'll notice that God doesn't love us so that we will love God in return. God loves us. God chooses to sacrifice for our good, independent of our response. Because that's what love does. I find it interesting that according to this passage, love doesn't require that love be returned. Our passage says that this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. In other words, God's love was to and towards and for us, irrespective of our response. God doesn't love us so that we will love Him back in return. God loves us because it's who He is. He sent His Son not in order to buy our love, but to show His already love for us. He loves us not because He feels it, but because He chooses it. It. That being said, of course we then respond to that love. But God's love isn't contingent on how we respond. Of course, because of that love, because of the overwhelmingness of that love, how can we not respond by both loving God more and loving others better? You see, the gift of Christmas that we celebrate is not just that a baby was born, but that God sent His Son into the world as a picture, as an example of love to and for and through us, that we might know that we are loved, so that we might love and become a different people, a people of love, so that we might learn to know and rely on God's love to us so that we might become a people who love better. Quite frankly, maybe this is what our passage means when it tells us in this world we are like Jesus. Because as we become more like Jesus, as we learn to love more like He loves us, we become more like Him as we love others. If that's all there was in this passage, it would be more than enough. But remember, we've spent some time over the past couple of months talking about the kingdom of God. And in doing so, we've been talking about this constant now and not yet quality of the kingdom of God. And as we talked about even last week, maybe some of the principles of the kingdom share this same attribute. So as we talked about, there's a part of the kingdom of God that is right here, right now. As we live the rule and reign of God, in this moment, we are bringing a little bit more of His kingdom come. His will be done. We are bringing His kingdom to bear on this world around us. That being said, as we look around at our world, clearly not everything is under His authority yet. And so there's a, another aspect of the kingdom of God that is not yet. The more we live it out, the more we bring it, and yet it's not all here just yet. And so we talk about the kingdom of God being now and not yet. What if love shares that same quality? As we choose to sacrifice for the good of someone else, I am loving in a real and present and powerful way right here and right now. 
bringing a little bit more of the kingdom of God here. And yet, my choices still sometimes remain fickle. And I choose other things when the, it becomes too difficult. And, and my selfishness keeps me from really sacrificing the way that I should. And my knowledge is so incomplete, so I don't even know how to work for someone else's good. And yet, even in all of that, what if God is still working and developing and growing my love towards what it could become, what it should be? Frankly, one of the most amazing parts of our passage is this line in verse 12, if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. His love is made complete in us. The part of that that stops me in my tracks is that God is the one who can live in me and who completes love. In other words, I know that my love is insufficient and incomplete, and yet God isn't done, or, or isn't powerless with that. Instead, God is there to perfect, to refine, to grow and empower my love and make it something else, pointing my love towards His all-sufficient, perfect love. And then not just my love, but our love together. Remember, this isn't just that I should do this or you should do this. We, as a people, should love one another better. But again, what if God is working in us, perfecting and completing our love together? Living in us, loving us, and perfecting our love together. In February 1994, Randy and Victoria became engaged. According to the Chicago Tribune, a short time later, Randy received bad news from his doctor. Randy had suffered from diabetes since he was 12. He was now 46, and the doctor said the diabetes had ruined his kidneys. He would need a transplant to save his life. Randy brought his fiancée, Victoria, to hear what the doctor was saying so that she would understand how the diabetes would affect their future. The doctor said that each year only 4,000 kidneys become available to the 36,000 people who need a transplant. Usually family members provide the best match for a transplant, but none of Randy's family matched his profile very well at all. Victoria spoke up. Why don't you test me? The doctor gave her the tests and the couple went home and, and kind of forgot about it because there wasn't much chance that it would be a match until the phone rang. Randy's doctor reported that her immune system was an identical match. And so the couple made plans to be married on October 11th, 1994. And about a month after that, after a five and a half hour operation, Victoria gave her husband Randy her left kidney. It was believed to be the first organ swap between a husband and a wife in the United States. Randy and Victoria's love literally depended on her sacrifice for its survival. And yet, that's true of all loving relationships. It depends on the choice to sacrifice for the other person's good. God lives in us and completes our love as we love one another. This is what God calls us to, commands us to, invites us to. And as we do, we become a people of love, a people of the kingdom of God. If you would join me in prayer. Oh, gracious God, we pray that you would help us. Help us to live out your kind of love, that we might choose to sacrifice for the good of others, that we might be filled and rely on your love, and then that we might be transformed by who you are and by how you complete our love. Lord, help us to be a kingdom people. Help us to show your love to others. Help us to be more like your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen.
At this time, let us continue with our worship. The scriptures teach that it is better to give than receive. And so we want to respond to what we have heard. We want to respond to the love of God by the giving of our tithes and offerings. Uh, you can do that online. You can do that by sending something to the church. Uh, but we don't want to leave a time of worship without a little bit of time for us to each individually give of ourselves to God. Uh, if you would join me in prayer. Uh, gracious God, we pray that you would use these gifts to your glory, that you would use the gifts of our lives for your glory as well. We thank you for the abundance that you have showered upon us, and we respond to your love in worship. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, let us give of our tithes, offerings, and lives to God.
And now let us affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us continue in our worship. Before we're done today, a couple quick announcements. First, uh, I want to make sure you know about our Christmas Eve service. It's happening at 5.30 on Christmas Eve out in the field. Uh, there'll be a big tent. There's some open seating. We'll be wearing masks. We'll be bundled up. But we would love it if you would join us for Christmas Eve at 5.30 p.m. on Christmas Eve night. There's going to be a big email that goes out this week with a lot more details about uh, what to bring and how to prepare for that. Maybe even you could help set up a little bit. Um, but again, a lot more information will come out this week about that service. We have a congregational meeting scheduled for January 3rd for the purpose of receiving and voting on the nominations from the nominating committee on new elders and deacons. We'll be doing that online and in person at 10 o'clock a.m. on January 3rd, so please add that to your calendar. There's several service opportunities uh, for children. There's uh, opportunities for us to raise some funds for hurricane relief. All of that can be found uh, in the e-news or in the bulletin as well. And then finally, we're continuing our pattern of worship where we have an online service, we have two worship gatherings, and then we have our nine o'clock worship service. We'd love it if you would worship with us soon. Uh, and with that, all the rest of the announcements can be found in the e-news or in the bulletin. And now receive the benediction. God's blessings be upon you today and forever. God's love abound over you, in you, and through you. God's blessings be upon you today and forever. Amen.